Hello. Nick. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the seventh uh, webinar in a series of webinars um, that are, have been organised and run by the Diplomacy Training Programme, Youth Law Australia, Australian Lawyers for Human Rights, and also for this webinar in um, partnership with the Australian Human Rights Institute. So today's webinar is on the topic of the rights of children and climate change. And as I mentioned, it's the seventh in a series of webinars that have been striving to develop greater knowledge and understanding of the Convention on the Rights of the Child throughout Australia. In response to the government's reports on the implementation of the Convention in Australia, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child emphasised, and this is a direct quote, that the effects of climate change have an undeniable impact on children's rights and was also concerned about the state part insufficient progress on climate goals and targets committed um, to in the Paris Climate Agreement and its continuing investment in um, extractive industries, in particular coal. So by way of a couple of housekeeping rules, I think we're hearing a bit of um, background sound. So if it's okay, can you please mute uh, your sound? Um, and also, um, you know, you will have an opportunity to ask questions in today's uh, webinar. Those can be made uh, via the chat function at any time. You will also have access to um, some links that are going to be provided um, by Claire from DTP throughout uh, the, the uh, webinar. So I'm really um, delighted to be able to, um, to welcome you all today. Um, and I'd just like to flag up at the outset that the Committee on the Rights of the Child is in the process of drafting a general comment on children's rights and climate change. And they will be calling for submissions ahead of the 2023 release. And that will make recommendations as to what the government should be doing to protect, respect and realise children's rights in the face of climate change. On that note, I'd also like to really warmly welcome um, uh, Dr. Makiko Atani, who is the chair of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child 2021 to 2023. Um, she is an international human rights lawyer who is based in Tokyo, and she has extensive experience of practicing in law and family law and women's and children's rights and we really warmly welcome um, Dr. Atani uh, here today and thank you for her attendance and participation in the webinar. I'd also like to now uh, welcome our two speakers. Um, so Anjali Sharma is one of the eight young people who brought a case against the Federal Minister for the Environment in Australia and that case argued against the extension of a mining venture which the young people said would contribute to global warming and also cause them irreparable harm. The court in that case found that the minister had a duty of care not to cause the children personal injury. So uh, we're really, really delighted to have um, Anjali speak um, today. And I'd also like to introduce at this point our second speaker, Dr. Noam Peleg, who is a senior lecturer at UNSW and an expert on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. He has written extensively on state obligations under the Convention and the legal status of the treaty in domestic jurisdictions. And he has written about the court's decision in the um, Sharma case and, and Claire will populate the chat box with some links to um, Dr. Peleg's uh, writing on that issue. So um, first of all, uh, I'd like to pass over now to um, Anjali to, um, to present to you and welcome and thank you for your, your time and your contribution today. And just to note as well, how inspiring you and your peers um, are to us in taking this action. So thanks Anjali, over to you. 
Thank you so much, Faith. Um, and yeah, just before I start, I'd like to say I'm so honoured for this opportunity. Um, I've been studying about the UN's work and about the conventions of the UN, um, specifically, specifically the rights of the children. And um, I think that it's really important to note that children will be disproportionately impacted by the harms of climate change, which is um, something that forms the basis of my activism. So um, yeah, I'd like to start by introducing myself. Um, like I said, my name is Anjali Sharma and I'm currently on the land of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation in Nam, also called Melbourne. Um, and I find myself really privileged to be here because when I was 10 months old, I moved from um, my, my town in Delhi in India to Australia. My family were economic migrants. We were um, moving for a variety of reasons. Um, we were moving for a better future for myself and my older brother in Australia. We were moving for safety and security for my whole family um, to escape the poverty and the crime that was rampant through Old Delhi where we lived. And I can definitely safely say that we left that behind. Um, we, we live a really privileged life here in Australia. Um, and what else we left behind was most of our family, um, our possessions and the life that my mom and dad had known and grown up with. Um, looking back on it and knowing what I know now, I can easily say that we also left it behind a country that objectively is a lot worse off than Australia, both financially and geopol geopolitically. Um, events that have unfolded in India over the time that my family has been here have formed the basis of many of our dinner time discussions, many hushed and panicked phone calls, and many, many prayers and tears. Events such as the horrors of the pandemic in India, which took hold really recently and tragically. But most commonly, India struggle with climate change and natural disasters, which has been um, beyond, beyond tragic. India faces constant earthquakes and cyclones, um, constant natural disasters, as well as the fact that just on most spring mornings, even the temperature um, have will have reached 40 degrees Celsius by by 8.30, 9.30 a.m. In fact, as we speak right now, this webinar, New Delhi is experiencing tragic floods that have taken lives already. This is a common occurrence in, um, in India and in countries that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. It's commonplace. Um, I've seen it. I've seen it and I've experienced it. Um, kids that ride their bikes or walk to school in my town in, in New Delhi, um, they regularly collapse on the roads on the way there. Um, from anywhere between spring and summer. The stray dogs that we have um, will line the sides of the streets panting. And, you know, our children, we aren't allowed to go outside to play badminton and hopscotch in the streets in summer and spring, as is our culture, our tradition. And the privilege disparity that exists between India and Australia, you know, the um, relative safety that we have here is what has formed my activism, formed the basis of my activism because here in Australia, we are so lucky to say that we aren't on the front lines of the climate crisis for most of us. After I log off from this meeting, I'm going to go about my daily life, which is relatively unimpacted by the effects of climate change. Something that I am so, so lucky to be able to say and something that the world's most vulnerable are not lucky enough to say. As we talk, First Nations communities, people of colour and the world's poorest are modifying their everyday lives to cope with the impact that climate change is having on them. Something that we, unfortunately, something that we fortunately don't have to do right now. And another really vulnerable group to the impacts of climate change is the world's future generation, the children. Um, something that plays on our mind so often is the fact that as we sit here, you know, unable to vote, unable to make our voice heard in any avenue that isn't activism, which is so often ignored by our government here in Australia, um, the government is making decisions that will fast track the climate crisis that will lead to rising temperatures and more common natural disasters. And it's something that we sometimes feel like we have no say in. Um, all these vulnerable groups that I've listed, we, we, we virtually have no say as the governments of the richest, um, most developed countries, they shirk their fiscal and their socio-political responsibility in the face of climate change for their own natural interests. And yet we are the ones that will be worst harmed. 
us children have the inherent right to inherit a world where our future is just as guaranteed and safe as it has been for previous generations. But there is no denying that, unfortunately, this is not the case anymore because study after study tells us that we only have a certain given number of years before the world reaches a tipping point, which sets off various negative feedback loops from which there is no coming back. And the anxiety that comes with the truth of that statement is what led me to start organizing student strikes for climate, which is how I, um, which is how I got involved in activism. And this is a common theme I find among children. Um, I find the anxiety that is rampant as um, every every news article comes out saying that the government has approved a new coal mine. Every news article about um, companies such as Adani, Santos Origins, abuse of human rights, their disregard for our First Nations people um, and their the role that they play in fast tracking the climate crisis, which um, ultimately we will bear the brunt of. Um, The anxiety that comes with that is very significant and a very common theme in the lives of us children. So um, that's how I started organizing school strikes for climate, which is a very big movement in Australia. Uh, One of our biggest strikes happened just pre-pandemic in 2020, where we turned out 200,000 people to the streets of Melbourne, um, all fighting for climate justice, which was very, very heartwarming to see. And um, through my time organizing strikes, I've met many people. um, And one of them has been incredibly influential in my life. Her name is Vasha Yajman. She is a few years older than me, and um, she's another Indian school strike organizer. And ultimately, it's because of her that I have gotten the chance to leave this legal case. After Vasha, Vasha graduated from School Strike for Climate, she became a paralegal at Equity Generation Lawyers, which is a small law firm um, bringing climate cases against big names. They've brought climate cases against REST Superfund, against the Commonwealth, and most recently, the Environment Minister of Australia, Susan Lee. And that's where I come in, because I have had the absolute privilege to lead this legal case, to be the, um, the main litigant against Susan Lee. This case, um, known as Sharma versus Environment Minister, is brought by eight litigants around Australia with myself as first named. And all of us litigants are so passionate and we have our own personal life stories with climate change. The one I've just shared with you about my community in India, um, there's also litigants from rural and regional areas who have seen mining and fracking happen in their in their daily lives. There are litigants with stories making them particularly vulnerable to climate change and there are litigants who suffered incredible loss in Australia's tragic 2019 to 2020 bushfire season and along with our lawyers we have an amazing litigation guardian called um, Sister Bridget Arthur. So how this case came about is Equity Generation Lawyers has been developing our case theory for many years. The argument is based around the Vickery Extension Project, which is an extension of a coal mine in rural New South Wales that, if built, will emit 375 million tonnes of carbon dioxide in its lifetime, which will then export the coal dug up to countries such as Japan and Taiwan to to be burnt. So you can you can imagine how significant this mine is going to be because 375 million might not be a number that you can put into context so easily, but to put it into context, it's around 20% of Australia's yearly emissions just from one extension project. Uh, um, we all believe strongly that Australia, Australia is at a crossroads right now coming out of the COVID pandemic where we really have the chance to shift our country into a safe, renewable Um, renewable energy path that will create jobs coming out of the pandemic but also put us on track to a safe climate future and so keeping in line with this with this argument um, our legal team developed an idea to argue the presence of a duty of care Um, a duty of care which would be established between the environment minister and all young people in australia so the, um, the concept of a duty of care is very famous. It was um, originally established in Australia, sorry, um, in the Commonwealth under the very famous Donoghue versus Stevenson case, which found that anybody, anybody who, whose actions can impact another person is considered their neighbour in law. And we strongly believe that if applied here, it um, 
it should be applied here because Susan Lee, her actions as the Environment Minister, which currently consists of apparently approving coal mines and gas fueled power stations, will be the decisions that ultimately shape the world that we will be left with. So we argued that this duty of care is very much applicable here, and we argued that should certainly approve this Vicar Extension project, the duty of care would be breached. And on the 27th of May um, this year, in the, this was heard in the federal court, sorry, in March, and on the 27th of May this year, um, Justice Mordecai Bromberg found that um, this duty of care was present and um, last last month Justice Mordecai Bromberg officially wrote the duty of care into Australia's law, meaning that now um, it exists in Australia's law that the Environment Minister has a duty of care. This is a really significant finding. Um, it changes the law of Australia, um, hopefully if upheld on appeal, which Susan Lee has decided to appeal. Um, but if upheld, this will mean that um, any any fossil fuel project or any project that Susan Lee approves now that has significant carbon emissions um, gives us a ground to sue Susan Lee um, on the basis of negligence, on the basis of um, breaching this duty of care. So it's a really significant finding and we really hope that it will set a precedent for um, the approval um, for not allowing the approval of further coal mines, further gas projects, as is so imperative to see in Australia right now. Um, and so it was a really big reaction. Um, sometimes I like to say actually that I live in an echo chamber because often all I find is that I'm surrounded by my climate activist friends and others in the activism space. But this case and the reaction to this case and the reaction to this incredible finding has definitely dragged me out of that echo chamber with the immense amount of attention and media reaction after this finding, um, given that it changed the law of Australia. It's been covered by every major news source. It's trended on social media. It's been followed by academics as far away as London and New York. And sometimes the scale is really hard to imagine for me because especially when my friends tell me I've become a case study for their legal studies class or an example for their English argument analysis, it's really hard to think about the fact that I too am sitting through my legal studies class and my English argument analysis, but the scale of this case is so much larger than my little bubble. And it's really nice to think about the fact that now that it has made an impact onto the law of Australia that um, hopefully this will set a precedent, like I said, for the um, not allowing the approval for any further coal mines. Um, I'm grateful to be surrounded by overwhelmingly positive reactions. Um, all my friends and teachers are incredibly proud and um, following the case closely. And the first morning, actually, of the hearing in Melbourne in March this year, there was a snap protest on the steps of the federal court where um, many climate activists turned out um, and it showed the court that many young people want climate action, which is really the point that we are at in Australia now. There are protests after protests. There are so many, um, so many movements, so many climate movements taking um, up their own space in Australia. There's um, the student strikes for climate. Then there's also people who are undertaking more serious civil disobedience. And then there's people who are using the app, different avenues of change, such as mine, um, bring legal cases. And it shows that Australia is at a point right now where um, one of our biggest priorities is climate action. Um, and so that's why I really feel like this, um, this federal court finding reflected that. And I, um, Susan Lee is now um, in a position where um, if she approves any further coal mines, um, it's going to cause major backlash and hopefully put Australia on the right path um, coming towards the climate crisis. Um, so many jo journalists and lawyers and politicians that I've had the chance to meet through this experience have told me their thoughts and I've actually been made aware of the fact that my case is the first of around 10 cases that have, have tried the same argument, but my case is the first to succeed, um, which I'm very grateful for. However, of course, there have been really negative reactions to my case. And one comment that actually stuck with me that I'd like to share was, I've been told that what I'm doing is undemocratic. I've been told that, um, you know, if Australia is a place where anybody can bring a class action, then really people can 
start bringing class actions against whatever issue they feel is important and it becomes an undemocratic system where the government has to answer to all its citizens but my my reflection on that which i have been reflecting on a lot is um i feel that if if there are people like me who are as concerned about an issue as i am then an avenue for change in the legal system um, and using that avenue for change is one of the most democratic things you can do. Because class actions, because the, the legal case that I've undertaken has not been an easy ride at all. I've juggled it with my year 11 studies and I've juggled it with my um, my commitments to my family, to my friends, to my sport. Um, and still climate change is something that is so personal to me. See, coming back to my story um, of my community in India, um, and I definitely believe that the Australian government is not living up to its responsibility and the fact that I have the chance, that I've had the chance to not only protest, not only, um, you know, show my discontent in activism, but to take this to the courts. And I, I believe that's one of the most democratic features of this country. And it comes back to why I do this, because I believe that as a young person, as a person of colour, I have the right to a safe world, as do all vulnerable and marginalised people. This right is very obviously being infringed upon by our government, whose priorities clearly, clearly lie with allies and friends in the fossil fuel industry and the money in mining. Over the past year, our government has appointed a gas executive to be head of the COVID-19 reco economic recovery. They've established a Jazeera, which is a scientific research institute funded by the five biggest gas companies who are conducting research into whether fracking is good for the environment. So you can you can tell which, what outcome they're going to come up with if they're funding it themselves. They've lobbied countries to stop the Great Barrier Reef from being listed as endangered, and they've continued to approve coal mine after coal mine, gas pipeline after gas pipeline. And with every passing minute, we're moving closer to that tipping point that I told you about. And yet our government has made their priorities clear, which is why I am so proud to be bringing this case, and I'm so proud of the impact that it has made I think that young people shouldn't have to be using the legal system. They shouldn't have to be using civil disobedience to ask for their basic right to life to be upheld. But this is the situation we have. And I'm also embarrassed that Susan Lee is appealing this decision, essentially going to court with public money for her right to not have a duty of care to children, her right to cause to, to undertake actions that will cause harm to children. But like I said, um, this case has has caused a splash in the media and changed the law of Australia and I hope that this is the path that Australia is on because like I said all marginalized groups young people people of color first nations communities have that right to life which is being infringed upon by the decisions that our government makes and I'm proud that I've stood up against it and I'm proud that people like me are standing up against it all over the world so thank you thank you so much um and We've got some amazing comments of support for you in the chat box um, that you might want to check out. Uh, I think I'll read a, a few of those out for you, which summarize up so well um, my thoughts too. Ramesh has said, so eloquent, good on you for standing up um, for environment and the impact of climate change and, and wishes you all the best. And then other people have said, thank you for sh showing such amazing leadership and impact, amazing work, well done. Um, so thank you so much for sharing with us um, about the case, um, about your activism, um, and also to about um, your journey in that case. And, um, you know, also to how much you've juggled um, in, in being involved in that, um, your schoolwork, your family life and everything. Um, we will have some questions for you later after Dr. Plague um, speaks now. So I'd like to now hand over um, to a colleague um, and, um, you know, very active member of DTP's work in children's rights, um, Dr. Noam Plague, who has written about this case um, and also, um, you know, has international expertise in children's rights. So I'd like to pass over now to, to Noam and thank him for speaking today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faith. Uh, uh, and hello, everyone. I would 
like to start my talk by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Euro nation, uh, where my home and what used to be, what's known as Sydney uh, is based upon, and to extend my uh, acknowledgement to any Torres Strait Islander person who is with us, is with us today. Uh, and to congratulate Anjali for their amazing work uh, in this space uh, and for uh, uh, doing the civic duty and going to court and for the many accountability and for bringing this uh, uh, amazing, uh, amazing uh, development in Australian in Australian law. So, uh, although Anjali uh, described uh, in details uh, what sort of change this case has brought domestically, uh, I will be slightly less uh, uh, positive in my talk, and we try to look at the situation and to look in more details into the court's analysis from a child rights uh, perspective, and to see what sort of shortcomings, if any shortcomings, can be identified by the court. Uh, has said about children, mainly about uh, why the minister have, have a duty of care uh, to children and the, the ways in which the court uh, uh, understood what the best interest of the child means uh, in, in our context. Uh, so what, that's, the, uh, that's the structure for, for my talk. Um, and we'll leave enough time uh, for, for questions and answers uh, afterwards. Uh, as I uh, briefly said, uh, the case involved uh, Anjali uh, uh, and eight other children uh, who took the Federal Minister of Environment to the court saying that their action uh, should be subject to the duty of care. Um, and the court, the core argument was that the common, that the minister has a common law duty uh, to protect younger uh, people against the harm that climate change has caused and therefore asked that the mining expansion uh, that was on stake then uh, should be halted. No child rights argument were made at the court as Australia has no meaningful domestic human rights mechanism uh, that can be used as a vehicle to make these arguments in, uh, in court or to make a successful argument in court. And, and for the non-lawyers among us, uh, the, this argument that the minister has a duty of care is a bold, is a bold and, 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 hope, and, and thankfully successful attempt to expand the duties that the minister has under private law essentially arguing that the minister has an uh, unwritten duty, uh, which is an explicitly written in law uh, uh, to care for children uh, when it makes decisions about their present and about their future. In the course of the litigation, the court heard scientific evidence that highlighted how adults' action or lack of them lead to significant, uh, significant climate changes. Uh, the judgment describes the dystopian future that human rights uh, and human beings saw in Australia can expand to experience uh, by the end of the 21st century and how life will look like when, for example, temperature rises by two, three, or four degrees, uh, the, increased, uh, the increased risk of uh, bushfires flood across the eastern shores and uh, the experience of certain, certain species. The court accepted the children's argument, but failed to provide any concrete remedies and did not issue any of the orders that the children have sought. The government appealed the case, arguing that it has no duty of care for children in this context, which is a very disappointing position and a breach of an explicit duty that the, that the government has under Article 4 of the UN Convention on, on the Rights of the Child, a convention that Australia has signed and ratified in 1990. The court based its decision, its decision on the finding that children's vulnerable uh, uh, vulnerability so is clear, that's a direct quote in the judgment, and therefore it is various, children are adversely affected by the lack of action of the minister. The court reiterated the very problematic and frankly uh, uh, just wrong TIHO decision that the High Court made in 1995 that confines the principle of the best interest of the child to be a procedural requirement. The court also accepted the government argument that the minister had children best interest at heart when they made a decision about the environment, but no evidence for that uh, were given to the court or at least no evidence for that uh, uh, were then replicated in, in the judgment. We will dedicate the webinar to the best interest principle in November, but let me just say a few words about it now. The court was willing to accept the minister's claim that it considers children's best interest without seeing any good evidence for that. And I appreciate that the presumption that, that accepts government assertions in this space, but when it comes to children, it usually proves to have a very little with reality of things. I would be very surprised if an evidence-based analysis of how the decision to grant this mining license and how they will affect children and their rights has been done, and if it was based on an up-to-date understanding of what the best interest means, and if children were invited to participate in this exercise. Child participation is not only an explicit right of children under the convention, but, all, but also an inherent element of any best interest analysis that ones need to make and that the minister had to perform. In other words, performing a best interest analysis without listening to children means that you haven't compl uh, complied to your obligations under 
either under Article 3 of the Convention that protects the right uh, of children to, best in, to have their best interest as a primary consideration, or under Article 12 of the Convention that protects children's right to participation in decision concerning, concerning their life. This one. Another problem with the court's approach, sorry, to the best interest principle is that it didn't take into account two other dimensions of the principle. First, that the best interest principle is a, is a substantive right of children, and second, that it is an interpretive legal principle. The court also said that the government has a duty of care due to, and I'm quoting, the special vulnerability of children, and they're again, I quote, their innocence, and therefore that they are in need of protection. But this anachronistic uh, perception of children and, and of childhood that subjugate children uh, to uh, their legal positionality to some paternalistic government care and denies, denies children duty and agency and their uh, uh, being human rights holders in, in their own rights. And as we just heard from Anjali in her description, describing children as vulnerable or incompetent can be more detached from reality. A children's rights approach to the Sharma case would have established the state's duty of care on the basis of state's duty to respect children's human rights as articulated in articles 4, 5, and 18 of the convention. It will also require paying attention to all four guiding principles of the convention in addition to specific rights of children that are relevant here. For example, the right to health, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to family life, and the right to development. The right to development under Article 6 of the Convention, which is a unique right of children and one of the four guiding principles of the Convention. <clears throat> Sorry. Is an important element in of itself and simultaneously it helps, it enables uh, uh, establishing a duty of care uh, for the present and for the future of children. With the lack of an explicit right uh, to environmental justice under the convention, the right to development provides a good pathway to consider intergenerational rights obligations and to establish states' duties to act today to promote and protect rights of future generations. In some random comments over the years, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has connected the right to development and child, and child development and environmental issues uh, together, but there is a room to develop this much, uh, a much more robust approach in this, in this space. The failure, however, to use child rights terminology and obligation is a missed opportunity uh, to substantiate rights and provide children with the remedies that they have asked for by the court. But in terms of domestic law, and Anjali uh, uh, has adequately described, this case is certainly a big win. We, should, uh, uh, we shouldn't dismiss the recognition of the common law duty of care that was established by the court, not least because it can be utilized in future litigation, as Anjali was saying, to demand and enforce concrete, concrete remedies. It also paves the way to all children, especially the more vulnerable group of children, like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in this country, to demand concrete remedies and to tackle the adverse effect that, that climate change will have on their future livelihood and their ability to maintain and enjoy their identity and community culture as protected by Article 31 of the Convention. The use of tort law, as I said before, is based on lack of domestic human rights mechanism. Looking at climate justice litigation around the world, we see a similar pattern where plaintiffs need to be very creative in articulating their argument based on the available legal infrastructure at, a, at any relevant jurisdiction. But where human rights frameworks are available, judgment uh, and judges engage with, this, with these claims. But a human rights judgment isn't necessarily a child rights judgment. Since 1990, more than uh, 1,300 climate-related lawsuits have been filed uh, worldwide. One case, which is considered to be the most successful so far, was heard in the Netherlands a few years ago, where the judge Supreme Court ruled that the government has an explicit duty to protect its citizens' human rights in the face of climate change, and therefore must reduce, for example, its emission by at least 25% compared to its levels uh, in 1990 by the end of 2020. Uh, just for uh, illustration, these compliance measures that the court uh, has imposed on the government worth about 4.7 billion Australian. Australian dollars. Let me put up the uh, relevant reference here in case anyone wants to see them, they are here. In Germany, the Federal Constitutional Court held just four months ago in March that the basic law, the, the Constitution of Germany, limits the scope for political decision-making with regard to protection of the environment. The court ruled that, the, that the environmental protection should be considered as a matter of constitutional significance due to a democratic deficiencies that children experience. 
children and future generations have no power to influence contemporary political decision-making, while the democratic political process is organized on short-term objectives, while ecological issues need to be uh, pursued over the long term. And again, as we just said from Ajali, children are excluded from, the, from this democratic decision-making process. Under the age of 18, they don't have the right to vote. So in other words, it's really the inability to participate in the political decision-making, the German court has said, in the, in the, in the general uh, political decision-making process that establishes the court's own duty of care, if you want to use Australian terminology, to, uh, uh, to rule about the compliance of the government with respect to its uh, uh, climate change uh, policies and implications. A children's rights case that is currently making its way through the European Court of Human Rights was recently filed by four children and two young adults from Portugal. This is the first climate uh, change case at the ECHR, demanding that 33 countries make more ambitious emissions cuts to safeguard the future physical and mental well-being of, of future generations and to prevent discrimination against the young and protect the rights to exercise outdoor uh, activities and live without anxiety. At the international level, a group of 16 children led by Greta Thunberg filed a communication with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in September 2019 under the individual complaint mechanism uh, that was established by the Third Option Protocol to the Convention. They claim that states fail to combat climate change uh, has violated the duties under the Convention to protect some dozen rights of children. Reading the communication, it seems that the focus is on the factual background with an attempt to make the empirical case for the fact that climate change A is real and B the, the consequences of it and the effects on future generation. Less attempt in this uh, uh, communication and less space is given to the, legal, to the legal argument. And this is a common theme that all of these cases have, including, including the Sharma case. The science on, on climate change, its environmental impact and the subsequent impact of human lives is overwhelming and clear. And it's uh, uh, in sharp contrast to the, some of the public debates about, about these issues. But the ways in which Thunberg uh, was mocked by politicians or the ways that Prime Minister Scott Morrison brushed off the Friday school strike for climate uh, march that Anjali uh, has organized, and when he sent children back to school, is a testament to the gener generational gap that we see in this space. As for children standing, Anjali and her friends had to use an adults as the litigation representative, system rehabilitated after, as they have no independent legal stand standing in, 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 in our legal system. And this is, I think, is the best indicator of how children's rights are treated in the Australian legal system so far. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Plague for his um, really informative presentation that's raised a lot of um, very, very interesting um, and important points. Um, and we really appreciate um, you know, that detailed analysis. Um, if you have any questions, I know some people have dropped me um, a couple of private messages that they have questions to ask. So if you'd like to, to populate the chat box with those, um, that would be great. Um, but I might um, kickstart um, some of the uh, the discussions and so Anjali, um, as you mentioned in your talk, the minister has appealed the decision. Um, are you able to share any um, details of your your plans should the decision um, go against you and your fellow students? We hope sincerely that it doesn't. Um, but is this something that you um, you have thought about? Yeah, well, whoever appeals, um, so Susan Lee's appealing, so she's going to be appealing to the federal court full bench. And we, like you said, we really do hope that that goes in our favour. And sorry for my dog in the background, but um, we hope that the um, finding is upheld. And if not, we always do have the option to um, take it to the high court, which I definitely think we will be planning because, um, like I've said, this finding is so imperative for Australia to up um, to uphold. Um to ensure that our environment minister is held to the standard that she needs to um and so i reckon that will be our plan should they um should it not be upheld um but the federal court has been really really good to us we've had some really good judges so um let's hope the right outcome happens thank you and welcome to your dog have you what's your dog's name this is maya um she's yeah, a little well pest sorry about her <laughs> Maya, it's nice to have her feature as well. Um, another question, and and those that you know have joined us, um, you know, please do um, you know populate the chat box with with questions. It would be great to hear um, from you all as well. Um, 
I was wondering whether you um, and your fellow um, students have been in contact with the UN um, at all and whether you feel there's any value from interactions with, um, with the UN. And we're also very privileged, obviously, to have the chair of the committee here today. So, um, you know, she may wish to, to, to speak or, or make a point as well. But I was just wondering, have you had any interactions with the UN as a group? We haven't actually, but I think it is a collective goal of all eight of us to um, attend a COP summit. Um, every COP summit that's happened for the recent few years, we have um, been watching closely and uh, we've had friends who've gone to um, COPs in the past and I have a friend participating in a pre-COP summit this year. Um, it's definitely been a goal of ours and um, so we really do hope to have interaction with the UN soon. Um, like I said, I've studied uh, the UN in global politics for a while now and I think the UN um, in its um, institution of global governance is so imperative to the world right now, um, upholding international human rights standards, international children's rights standards, which is something obviously that we are all so, pa um, so passionate about. Um, so yeah, we do hope to soon. Great, thank you. Um, okay, well, we've got some questions in, in the chat box. So um, Ramesh has asked, um, Anjali, thanks for a very um, insightful speech. As you put it, there is a strong lobby of people and organizations working as a nexus with the government and decision-making authorities to take actions that impact the climate adversely. Many bright children like yourself, um, although you and Greta Thunberg are unique as you have taken a legal avenue, um, starting from Severin Suki in 1992, these actions remain disconnected. Is there any idea um, do you have as to how to connect these movements? Or maybe you might view them as already being connected. Have you any um, reflections on that question from Ramesh? Um. This reminds me of a really interesting statistic that I've heard, which is that social change happens when you get 3.3% of the population participating. Um, and I think we've seen that so much with um, our international strike days where we've had strikes happen in 100 plus countries all around the world. So in a way, I definitely think that um, we are all um, connected in some way or another. But I think that a way to really reach that critical mass of people who are pushing for social change is to use institutions of global governance, like I've said, um, to use the UN, which has embodied, you know, a real cosmopolitan approach to climate change to um, other issues facing the world right now, to use um, our courts around the world, which are um, on our side apparently right now with findings like mine, with the finding against the, the Dutch government and Shell um, with recent finding, findings against Adani. I think that we really are getting to a point right now where the critical mass of people are starting to turn to our side and, um, like um, Noam definitely said, um, there's so many barriers to young people um, participating and making their voice heard around the world, just such as the fact that our case has to be brought by a litigation guardian on behalf of us. But I think that, um, you know, we continue to explore these avenues that we have. There's courts, there's the UN, there's um, activism, and more and more avenues will open up to us. Soon there's going to be parliament, you know, and that's how we make the change. Thank you so much. Okay, I uh, really appreciate um, your responses to those. So a question and um, perhaps maybe Noam can address, is there any precedent outside the climate change area where the rights of the child have been held to include intergenerational equity rather than being confined to their rights while they are children? This is an excellent question. Uh, the short answer is no, at least not to, to best of my knowledge. There were a few attempts in the literature to try to uh, uh, use the convention as a vehicle for intergenerational uh, um, justice mechanism. Um, some were more successful than the others or more convincing than the others, but in terms of litigation or having a successful attempt uh, in court, I'm not aware to do any such uh, attempt. We've also had um, a question from Roton about um, who will ensure children's safety and security of children during natural disasters because their families are unable to during poverty um, and governments are busy tackling the disaster. Um, so it's just a question of, um, and, and there's a lot of context here about um, similar 
to examples that um, Angeli mentioned um, about devastation in countries due to natural disasters. Um, any thoughts or reflections on that question? Can you repeat that? You cut short. Oh, sorry. Um, so it's a question about who will ensure children's safety and security during natural disasters um, because their families are unable to due to poverty um, and governments are busy tackling that disaster. Uh, well, the, the, the answer under the convention is quite clear. Uh, uh, article 4 and Article 18 suggest that if parents are unable to execute their duties for their children, then it's there about the, the government to step in. Uh, and poverty is surely a, a reason why parents, some parents and some families can protect, protect their children. Uh, and more so, some countries are poor. And there was a comment on the chat about uh, the situation of children in Bangladesh. Uh, and Article 4 goes uh, even more than that and oblige uh, some international cooperation. And where state parties uh, uh, cannot provide for children in their territories and cannot provide the necessary assistance for families in their territories, it's a duty of other uh, contracting uh, uh, parties to the convention to step in and to provide their, their assistance. And in this space, if we speak about natural disasters, it can be financial remedies. Uh, it can be uh, in the form of hosting uh, uh, in what maybe become international uh, relocated people uh, to welcome uh, people who need to flood uh, and to leave their areas of, of living into, into an, uh, their own jurisdiction, or either on temporarily or on more permanent basis. Uh, and that truly, this is an explicit uh, duty that states have under, under the convention. Thanks, Noam. We have a comment and question from Anne-Marie. So she says, inspirational, Anjali, um, which inspirational is used throughout this chat box a lot. So. Um, uh, the question is, do you think the climate change case will have influence in other areas in terms of children's rights? So have you had any thoughts or have you thought about the, the impact um, more broadly of, of the case? It's definitely not something that I've um, thought about before this question. Um, I'm finding it pretty hard to get a, get my head around the scale of this case. But now that I think about it, I think that the duty of care has been written into law for the environment minister in particular. But there's no reason why the duty of care shouldn't apply to other um, other ministers. You know, the minister for immigration, the minister for home affairs, the prime minister. Um, they're you know they're making decisions right now on refugees. They're making decisions right now on many issues that will impact um, us. And I think that if the duty of care exists for Susan Lee, there's no reason why it doesn't exist for other senior members of our parliament who are also shaping our future right now. So I think that um, it, it definitely lays down implications for um, future findings that our court could possibly um, see. And I think that it, it starts another avenue for change for hopefully people who are um, passionate about other areas that um, children's rights are being violated, such as um, child asylum seekers to um, bring cases. Yeah. Thanks, Anjali. And um, so Georgina has said, terrific presentations, Anjali and Noam, thank you. Uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recently resolved to prepare its next general comment, um, which I mentioned in the introduction on children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change. What are your thoughts on the influence, if any, this general comment will have in holding states to account for their climate change policies? So perhaps Noam, you might want to comment first. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I, I don't have a crystal ball to try to predict what the influence might be. Uh, but I think the question uh, uh, includes a number of elements. First, it really depends what the uh, general comment will say. Um, and I appreciate that uh, the chairman of the committee, uh, uh, Chairperson, uh, Dr. Otani, is here with us. Uh, it's up to her and, and the other 17 members uh, uh, to decide how bold they would like to be uh, and what sort of duties they would articulate for states, parties uh, in this space. Um, and it will all, all depend on that. Um, and only then, when we see what sort of obligations the committee will articulate in this space, and as I said in my presentation, we don't have an explicit article that speaks about uh, the right of children to an environment. The convention was drafted in the, in the 1980s. Uh, this conversation wasn't part of, of the human rights language back then. Um, so the committee and, and, and people who worked on these issues uh, in the past have to be very creative. It needs to be very creative uh, in the ways in which they anchor some positive duties that states have in this document. And at the end of the day, we speak about the legal document. 
Um, we have broader advocacy effort in the space of climate change, uh, but here we speak about an international treaty that states have signed up to uh, that doesn't speak about it explicitly. Uh, uh, and there is as much as you can read into it, the convention has its own, its own limit. Um, one usable concept that the convention includes, as I said, it's the right of development. It also includes other uh, specific rights that are directly affected by the adversarial effect that uh, climate change has on, on children's livelihood and lives. Uh, and as Jali was saying, education, health, uh, mental health, uh, for sure, uh, the ability to, uh, to uh, so of the families to make and means a uh, question of poverty and so on and so forth. Uh, so once we see uh, uh, how the committee articulates state's duty uh, in this space, uh, then the next step will be to hold states to account. Uh, and there are different mechanisms to do so. Children will be able to do it uh, when they demand that their own governments uh, to, hold, to hold them into account in the relevant pathway that they have in, in every country where they live. Uh, and Anjali and the friends had a very successful attempt domestically without using the convention even once. Uh, uh, not just because it's not a legal currency in Australia, it is a, uh, uh, it holds a more a stronger, uh, uh, it is a stronger currency in other jurisdictions. Uh, and in regional instruments, uh, in the national courts, the ECHR, uh, functions under the European Convention of Human Rights, but it takes a uh, reference to the UN Con uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child as well. The Inter American Court of Human Rights uh, often refer to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child's work in this space, and therefore children in South America uh, might be more uh, beneficiaries of a future general comment. And then it's also about the committee itself and how it uh, monitors the implementation of, of the committee uh, in the ongoing uh, reporting uh, uh, and oversight mechanism that it functions and about states parties and about civil society and how civil society will make use of the convention and of the future general comment in hold uh, um, governments to account and then the, 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 the different advocacy pathway that the general comment will uh, uh, will provide which exceeds and I will finish my answer with that which exceeds uh, litigation. Uh, the general comments uh, uh, are used uh, sometimes more successfully uh, in advocacy efforts that, that happens outside outside the court. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions or out, outstanding comments um, that anyone wants to make? If you can populate those in the chat box. Um, we are very fortunate to have um, Dr. Atani, um, you know, attend today. You will be speaking at a, at a later uh, webinar, but do you have any comments to make um, to our speakers today? I might, in the last few moments, open that to you if you'd like to say anything in relation to the papers today. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the chance to um, say something. I uh, think, first of all, uh, Anjali, Thank you very much uh, for your very wonderful presentation. Very inspiring. And um, I have some questions. Um, you said that you were surrounded by the journalists and you received uh, the uh, contact from uh, London or New York. Uh, I have a question. Have you ever so, uh, received a contact from some children uh, in other countries inspired by your litigation? Because you're case is so uh, inspiring and um, now uh, the because the children uh, don't have the voting rights and uh, the although the committee is making a recommendation to the state parties uh, to uh, give the chance uh, to the children to be heard in developing uh, the environmental policies and uh, however um, uh, sometimes the litigation is a very powerful tool, uh, and, but the litigation has a lot of obstacles. And uh, so I wonder uh, if the children are trying to contact you uh, to um, get advice or lessons uh, to um, not copy, but uh, to initiate a similar actions in their jurisdiction. That's one question. And um, second one is not so much question, but a comment. Uh, Anjali, you, you emphasized that uh, the, um, the most vulnerable people, uh, including the children, are most dispro disproportionately affected. Uh, and this is true. And so, but uh, in the country, in the jurisdiction itself, the most vulnerable people have the most obstacle uh, to use the law or to bring the cases to the courts. Uh, but uh, this climate change issue is uh, first one to very 
difficult uh, aspects. One is generational equality, uh, equity, and another is the extraterritorial, uh, so the over, uh, crossover uh, feature. So the, the some state, um, what the state action do is actually if affecting uh, the people uh, in other countries uh, who are most vulnerable. And uh, Naum, Naum uh, pointed out uh, the duty to care actually should uh, go beyond the cross border. And uh, so this is the very um, complicated uh, situation of the climate case. And you might uh, know that uh, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, here are the old 196 uh, state parties. So uh, one of the challenge for us is how to, um, how to develop the uh, normative standards uh, about the uh, state's obligations uh, to use uh, their uh, power and um, exercise uh, their power uh, to discharge their obligations for the international cooperation. So how to uh, provide uh, the, not only the, um, not only to provide assistance, but to um, uh, stop uh, this climate change uh, by using uh, their responsibilities, which will affect the, not only the, their children, or not only their people, but the children in the countries which are far from uh, from your country. So this is a very challenging aspect. And uh, this, uh, this is just my comment, uh, but I just wanted to share, this is one of the, um, the challenge we have to tackle uh, in the general comment. So uh, what you are faced at uh, in your cases and through your litigation is very helpful uh, to um, sharpen our ideas, what we our general comment has to say. And, and finally, I'm sorry, um, third comment is about the remedies. I understand that in your case, uh, the court accepted the argument, uh, but didn't provide remedies. In this kind of case, what kind of remedies do you think is most um, uh, necessary uh, and in thinking of the time gap, time element, uh, bringing the case to the court itself takes time and the litigation itself takes a time, uh, but the climate change is happening and the children are growing. So, uh, so it's not, in many, case, in many countries, uh, because of the lack of the human rights mechanisms, lawyers use the general uh, schemes such as tort law, uh, but uh, uh, for this kind of case, the remedies uh, the, and uh, what kind of remedies should we uh, think of? So this is another challenge. I, in, this is my view that the general comment needs to clarify uh, when we talk about the state parties' obligations. Uh, to prevent, but also when it is happening, uh, how uh, the harm should be remedied. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, giving the chance uh, for me to uh, say uh, some words. Thank you. Thank Back you so you. much. Um, Dr. Otani, we really appreciate um, your attendance and participation. And thank you so much for those really important um, observations that you've made and the information about um, the committee and the general comment. It's been so helpful to have that um, as part of our conversations today. We have a really amazing, excellent community in relation to the chat box because I've had an alert and I have to apologize to Elvis who has had uh, their hand up for quite some time. Thanks to the, um, to the group for alerting me. Um, Elvis, um, over to you if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Uh, you're going to be our last question of the day and apologies for having to, to wait. Yeah, sorry and good morning to, oh sorry, I said good morning because it is morning for us here in South Africa. Uh, it's probably evening for all of you in, uh, in Australia. I'm Elvis Fokala and I head the, the Children's Rights Unit at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. But uh, now it's good to see you and to also hear you add more flesh to the conversation that we once had on Twitter when you, when you uh, flagged this, this case. For me, 
what what we want to see from a from a continental perspective or regional perspective uh, coming forward in this general comment is that um, more powers are given to children. And here I'm looking especially at the issue of ch children's uh, child agency, so that they can advocate for some of these issues that that uh, that that involves them, because what happens in the region here in the continent is that we we have states that have provided mitigating solutions to the adverse effect of climate change in the continent but you do not hear in most effects you do not hear the voices of children coming through uh, those uh, uh, those uh, processes of finding uh, solutions to those effects the impact of climate change is real and it's getting worse day day in and day out in the continent but the approach is so, so lethargic and so, so pathetic in the sense that um, it, it, it lacks inclusivity and especially from the aspect of, of involving children in that process. So one of the things that made me or got me to be involved in this, in this uh, conversation today is also based, as I said, on the strength of what uh, Norman and I discussed a couple of months back on, on Twitter about the involvement of child agency in this case. So that's what we want to see in this general comment coming forth as a continent and as those who advocate for children's rights or work uh, uh, dominantly in this section. It was just a comment and compliment for the great webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elvis, and thank you for your, your patience with your hand up. I didn't have that um, on my screen at the time. Um, Anjali has messaged me. Um, to say that she has some um, you know, observations um, and responses back to Dr. Onetti. I'm aware that we're um, at 5 p.m. Uh, Australian uh, Eastern time, but I'm sure people will forgive an extra few minutes. So Anjali, um, over to you really for uh, the last few words of the webinar and your response to Dr. Onetti's points. Thanks, Anjali. Yeah, no worries. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Otani. Um, so you did mention um, the fact that uh, the Australian government doesn't just have this duty of care to the Australian children, but really to um, all disproportionately affected people around the world. And it um, reminded me of the concept of third, third agenda emissions, where, you know, the coal that is burnt in Australia won't um, won't be stopped by Australian borders. You know, it's not just going to affect us here in Australia. When coal is burnt, when emissions rise into the air, it affects every single person in the world. And I think that the way that Australia is, um, you know, disregarding its responsibility, um, it really makes me think that um, we've studied in my global politics class, like I was telling you, that countries are mainly motivated to act by their own national interests. And this is where I want to um, commend the work of the UN, because one of um, countries' uh, main national interests are international standing. And when the UN um, releases its um, recommendations to countries and when the UN um, releases reports um, regarding the um, inaction of states on um, climate change, on human rights, on the rights of the children. Um, it provides ground for other um, for other countries or for um, NGOs like Amnesty International, like Human Rights Watch to um, attack, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, the international standing of states um, to call them out on their inaction. And I think that that's, um, like I was saying before, that's how we reach um, the critical mass. That's how we get states to um, be motivated to address these crises that are that are facing our world right now, because you can't compare climate change as a crisis to a crisis such as COVID. COVID is a safety crisis that is very much in your face right now. Um, states know that if they don't act, if they don't lock down, then um, it's going to hit us. It's going to hit us hard like it has hit India, like it has in Indonesia. Climate change isn't something that you can say because um, here in Australia, we are relatively blind to the impacts of climate change. But I think that um, the work that um, IGOs like UN and NGOs like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch do um, is um, so imperative to um, giving states motivation to act on these issues because when they're being called out is, um, you know, just pushing more momentum behind the cause um, and giving us... Um, an avenue to um, call out our states in action and um, hopefully force some action. Thank you so much, Anjali. 
Blazy, I've got to make an apology to you. I haven't been a quick reader on the chat box. Um, so actually, um, I'm pretty sure the final word goes to you, Blazy. Can you um, maybe unmute for us and, and um, tell us the point that you'd like to make? I think it's uh, I think it's unfair that adults think of children as uh, uh, adults think of themselves as superior to children and that they they are able to they should protect the children whereas children actually have the ability to use themselves things on their own and I think adults should be able to remember that they were children too and they have the and they ha, ha, should be able to remember that they have felt this and they have felt unsuperior towards adults and I think just because just because you're older doesn't mean you're wiser. I completely agree. Blazy, thank you so much for making those points. Um, what an amazing way to end um, our webinar. Thank you. You're getting lots of comments in the chat box that you're spot on, Blazy. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. And thanks for your patience while I caught up with the chat box commentary. Um, I'd like to conclude uh, the webinar by thanking um, all of our speakers all of our um, participants um, and lots of food for thought in all of the points um, that have been made today. So thanks for everyone, um, their attendance and participation. Um, take care and um, hope to see you at the next webinar.